Good evening, everyone. My name is Frances Wasserlein. I work for the Vancouver International Writers' Festival, and it is my great privilege to welcome you here this evening. This is an historic event, I think we would all agree. Um, I grew up a lesbian in the closet and came out in 1978. And the two people who are sharing the stage this evening with Eleanor Wachtel are part of the reason that me and many other young women and men are still alive and still vibrant and contributing members to our various communities. It is, it is simply a privilege to be in the same building with them. I'm certain that you share my enthusiasm. Um, Eleanor Wachtel, who is going to be the moderator for this evening, is a CBC, um, what does one say, radio host, um, on, uh, on her show Writers and Company. She's recently published a book of interviews by the same name. And Timothy Findlay and Jane Rule think I need uh, no, I think I need not further introduce. Please enjoy yourselves this evening, and thank you also for your great patience at waiting in line outside. Good night. It's also an honor for me to be here tonight, especially having lived in Vancouver for 12 years. It does feel like coming home. Uh, for my first couple of years in Toronto, I was in denial anyway. <laughs> I should tell you a little bit about what will happen this evening. This evening is actually an interviewer's dream because Jane Rule and Timothy Finley are going to talk to each other. <laughs> They're having a conversation and I just sit over there. <laughs> and then after a while I will ask them a couple of questions which in fact I have not, I asked them ahead of time. I said, do you need a shill? Do you want I could ask a few, you know, a plant, and they said no, it was all right, but I will ask them a few questions and just open up the conversation, and then open up the conversation to all of you, to the floor. I should add, in terms of the promotional plugs, that part of this will also be broadcast on CBC Stereo's The Arts Tonight, which is on at 6.30, 7 o'clock in Newfoundland. <laughs> And some of the topics that Jane Rule and Timothy Finley will touch on include coming out, sexuality, aging, children, writing, audience. But to begin, we're going to start with censorship. I, 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 I. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, it, it has happened uh, but, but just in this, these last few hours, and uh, therefore I've, I've put down a little note. Um, I want, of course, to mention the immediate situation concerning Little Sisters Book Emporium and the delay that has been imposed on the trial uh, in which Little Sisters has brought customs to, into the courts, Canada customs into the courts. It has now been delayed for one year. The government has brought in a very high-powered lawyer who is going to move heaven and earth to do us in. And in doing that, of course, they've burdened those of us involved with all these situations involving not only Little Sisters but Glad Day and uh, Androgyne in Montreal and all the other bookstores that are involved. Uh, immense expense, a lot of effort, and frankly a lot of wasted energy that could be better addressed to positive issues instead of this damned nonsense uh, that, is, that this government has uh, put upon us. In passing, before I conclude about uh, this immediate situation with Little Sisters, <clears throat> I want to register my shame 
in my country. A very fine American author has come to the other great literary festival in Canada, the Harborfront Authors Festival, David Levitt, who is, of course, one of the premier gay writers in the English-speaking world. As David Levitt is about to arrive in Toronto to read from his newest novel, that novel has been seized at the border by Canada Customs. Not universally, but only where it has been destined for gay and lesbian bookstores. As I say, this is pure shame. Now, as far as Little Sisters is concerned, and the future, because we have been given this hiatus of a year and this threat of this extraordinary, uh, all these legal guns that are being brought in by the government, hold on to your hats. We are going to need a war chest of $100,000 to fight this new aspect of the situation. And in order to begin getting that money, we are going to be asking for donations. As you leave here tonight, there will be a table with representatives from Little Sisters at the door. Even if it's a nickel, we need it. And even if it's a penny, it's worth it. And that's all I have to say about that. Thank you. Both of us have been called to be expert <coughs> witnesses at the trial of Little Sisters confronting customs. Both of us say we will move heaven and earth to get back here in uh, October of next year if, in fact, the trial goes on and there isn't another delay. My experience in this country with um, charges and censorship is that the government's chief tactic is not trying to win, but trying to bankrupt. When body politic was charged with being uh, obscene, it was in the courts for five years, five years. And at every level, they were found innocent. And at every level, the government appealed so that it cost the body politic more than $100,000 to defend itself. And this is standard behavior for our government in dealing with voices that they want to silence. And they deal with it very cynically, even when they know that their charges are fraudulent. They know that they have the power of our dollars, our taxpayers' dollars, to persecute us. And I think we have to have a political will that's new in this country. One of the things that encourages me, by the way, is that apparently uh, Customs is trying to dodge the charge that they're discriminating against gay and lesbian bookstores by seizing books from all independent bookstores now. I mean, <laughs> Duthie's is getting it, Monroe's is getting it, and I think maybe if they're getting it, the voice of the people will be raised in the land. But I think we need to let everyone know that this is a fight that is unconscionable and that we will no longer put up with having this kind of bullying going on from our government. And we're lucky to have an election. <clears throat> <laughs> hand, hand delivered, right? I mean, the timing couldn't be better if it tried. Now, um, you've been affected by this personally. I mean, your, oh, one I, of your I, books was stopped at the bar. I was uh, down in the desert when it happened, and it was a, a, a shipment of books because all of my books are not in print in Canada. Some of them have to be imported from my American publisher in the States. And uh, this is not for you, which is a book that won the um, Canadian Authors Association best novel for 1978. Canadian Authors Association is not known for being interested in soft porn. It's a fairly... <laughs> uh, <laughs> fairly... <laughs> Uh, and I apologize that it's not that interesting a book in that, in that area. It's a great title. Uh, yes. Well, that's why they thought it was dirty. The young in one another's arms, they were sure, would have some terrible thing in it. But no, it was seized because it was part of a shipment to a gay bookstore. 
And when I got back, my phone was ringing off the hook. And newspapers all across the country saying, aren't you shocked? Aren't you horrified? And I said, yes, I am. I am horrified that you make me the news story and that you don't make the story that this is what goes on every week to bankrupt these particular bookstores yeah. who are my source in a great many ways of reaching my audience. Mm -hmm. And, and let us not deny either the fact that this is how we make our living. That's right. And it's how people who run bookstores make their That's living. Right. That is no small matter in all of this. In other words, they're doing people out of the right to make a living. And it's not only in the courts, but it is that these books can't be sold, that we can't get our royalties, and it just goes on and on and on. Yeah. I think we need to talk about censorship in the wider sense, too, Tiff, because you've been censored, not just at the border. Well, I've, uh, yes, uh, but, the, but, the, the, but, but some of it's, I, you, you have to look at it as being screamingly funny, or else you go crazy, <laughs> like, because some of it really is funny. Uh, a, a book of mine called The Wars, in which, which is about the First World War, and it's, it's, it has a lot of scenes that involve uh, groups exclusively of, of, of male persons. <laughs> and uh, uh, the, 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 there is a scene which is, which is about as uh, ghastly a scene as I have ever had to write, in which Robert Ross, who is the, the young hero of the book, is raped by a group of his fellow officers in the dark, so he doesn't know who they are. And in a high school uh, in Ontario, uh, in the Bible Belt, which exists in every province, a sort of Bible Belt of, of uh, fanatic uh, believers, um, the issue was raised in a, in a, by one of the school boards saying that this book, because of the scene in which this young man was raped by other young men, promoted homosexuality. <laughs> fascinating when, interpretation yeah. of the word rape. Yeah. And a fascinating interpretation of the word homosexuality. Yeah. Uh, and what, the, of course, the outcome, thank God, was that the book was reinstated in, in the school system and all ultimately was well. But again, the harassment, the teacher in order, this is, this is the thing I think a lot of people don't understand. When a charge is laid against a book, the author or the teacher of the book is responsible to prove that the charge is false. The person laying the charge is not responsible for proving that they are right. The person who is being accused has to prove they're right. Mm. So someone says, you've written this appalling novel that promotes homosexuality because a man rapes another man. Um, deny it. And uh, this teacher had to spend weeks of his time doing just that, justifying teaching the book, losing his personal uh, hours, and uh, and the last ghastly aspect of this whole case was when they realized they were losing the case on the basis of this is a ridiculous charge, the next aspect was, it, uh, was Findlay and the teacher, who had never met, had nonetheless conspired <laughs> to promote homosexuality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's how far they'll go in this thing about... Uh, well, I mean, you take the censorship one step farther. I remember Margaret Lawrence telephoning me and saying, because she had been harassed by uh, religious fundamentalists about her books in the schools, she and sure she was had, extremely yeah. upset. One of the things I discovered was that Margaret Lawrence still had a listed telephone number. <laughs> <laughs> but she said, what do you do? when this sort of thing happens. I said, oh, well, I'm absolutely free of that. I'm never allowed in the schools in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> now, the only story of mine that has ever been included in an anthology that goes into the schools is the only story I have ever written about violence. And I don't, I don't apologize for it. I think it's a good story. But it is interesting to me 
that this is considered safe for high school students, where any story about human love would be uh, corrupting. And I do think we need to look at what we're frightened of and revise our sense of what it is we want people to hear. I think both you and I are really concerned with educating the young. Yeah. Really concerned with issues about sexuality, issues about responsibility, and the fact that I am not allowed into the schools. That, I mean, it just doesn't, doesn't even come up. There's nothing to fight. I'm just not there. I don't exist. Well, and that's the fight, isn't it? To yes. get you there, you've got to be there. And I don't mean simply that I should be there and my voice should be there to represent gay and lesbian people. I think I have a point of view about human relationships that moves, including us, in an ordinary and real world. And that ordinary and real world is very important for people to acknowledge and accept. And that that point of view seems to educators poisonous, I think is very dangerous. And I think it is dangerous not only to gay and lesbian people who may have to be invisible, therefore, have to put up with a great deal of harassment in the schools, but it's very dangerous for the whole sense of including all of us, including everybody who we are. And it's one of the reasons why I think both Tiff and I move in a very wide range of points of view. And I've been rereading Tiff's work, and I thought, this man writes from the point of view of a pregnant cat, <laughs> from the point of view of Lucifer, from the point of view of heterosexual women, one woman pregnant, gay men, the whole range. And it seems to me enormously important to your vision. Of course it is, and, but you do the same thing. Uh, but in a very different way. I think this is one of the things that fascinates me about the balance between writing that is, that is guided by a hand and a mind like yours and the writing that is guided by a hand and a mind such as mine, to get the English correct. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, th that is to say that we can both address from absolutely different points of view all the issues that involve the whole spectrum of people. Your people live in a world that is the world we basically live in day to day. They have contacts with one another over issues that are the issues, such as the issue we've just discussed. There's often an issue about art in your work. Mm. Uh, will the painting be hung, or will the gallery open, or whatever, whatever. Um, or where the artists survive. There, there is always the issue of can there be an accommodation between the so-called straight community and the people, the gay people who are moving in its midst. There is always an aspect of reconciliation in Rule's work. But, as, but reconciliation from a standpoint of questing from an unprovoked center, which won't be clear until I've spoken about what I'm driving at about the contrast. The unprovoked center in Jane Rule's work, it seems to me, is that it's simply there. Jane Rule is there at the center of her, of her work. She speaks absolutely directly from the place she sits, from the world she sits in, from the society in which she herself moves. This is being extremely objective. Forgive me. I think your name is Jane Rule. And you, are, you are sitting there. But I'm addressing this is objectively. <coughs> Timothy Findlay, on the other hand, sits not in the world where he actually sits addressing the very same issues. He sits in another place altogether a rhetorical place, and speaks with broader gestures, more dramatic gestures, larger gestures, theatrical gestures, and addresses the very same issues. And I think that that is fascinating, mm. because they both have their value. And, <coughs> and isn't it funny, mm. we both burn down houses. 
<laughs> That's inevitable. That's inevitable. Um, and there are all these wondrous people moving around the center of, of what it is that we're discussing. And the centers are basically the same. But you can't put them side by side and say, those voices are alike, because they're not at all. No, in they're, that, in, they're in, in the great contrast. strictest sense. And it, and it seems to me that there is a kind of moral passion in your work, a kind of morality tale sense of um, commanding us to face what is evil in us, what is keeping us from being fully human, a calling to task that is often, to me, terrifying and uh, electrifying, that I, I, I cannot not face the issues that you put before me, though sometimes they frighten me very much. And, and they, I want frighten, to, they frighten me. Too. And you can feel the sense of a terror in your work that is a, a terror that I think is uh, absolutely essential to a perception of the world we live in and calls us in that urgent way. I, I think both of us are moralists. I think, yeah, uh, I guess. and that is why it is so bewildering often uh, to be considered uh, people who are uh, out to, to corrupt the young. <laughs> Boy, it is. It, that's a very hard one to take, isn't it? Yes. It's a, it, it is, uh, there, and of course there is this mystique. It's almost romanticized uh, out there in the world at large. Uh, they're always talking about the gay world's involvement with the seduction of the young uh, in a sort of way that proves they're fascinated by this, but equally repelled and will put us away in five seconds flat um, the moment they find any sense of preachment or, as with the war, as you know, of trying to promote homosexuality as a lifestyle and so on. Um, the fact is, the young are all we have. It's the corniest thing in the world to say they are the future. But when you consider those amongst the young who are gay or lesbian, who have to face a world that is a world filled with the incidents we have just been describing, that are proscribing in the sense of what they have to deal with. Um, I had a letter from a mother very odd experience to have a, a parent write you and you must have had yeah. this as well. And this parent wrote, and she said, and she was wonderfully articulate, Jane. I mean, it was the kind of letter that was a great pleasure to read because it was written so well. She stated her case so brilliantly and with such uh, a keen sense of articulation. And she wrote about her son, who was 13 years old, and who had come out at that age to her and promptly uh, made a suicide attempt. And that was when she wrote. Now the boy is not, uh, he's still alive and, and still functioning and that didn't work. But this contact with this voice asking of me What's he going to read? What's there going to be in school? What's there going to be in society that says, we care about who you are? If your voices are silenced, if, if it's all being silenced around him, snickered at, made fun of, if there's no one there standing up and saying, I'm here too. And the first thing I did was I wrote back, a sort of three-page list, and it was wonderful because I couldn't stop writing the names of all the people who are gay. 
all the wondrous people who are gay, the people who are out and the people who aren't out. <laughs> <laughs> so that he could have something to, even if he rolled it up and crunched it in his hand as just a few pieces of paper, that was there to sustain, and if only I'd had that. If, I mean, we came out at a time when you didn't even say the word. No, you didn't, honestly, and, you didn't. And now it's the favorite r word on the playground for plaguing kids. Well, tell the story about the swimming pool. <laughs> tell, this is uh, a wonderful I, story. I have a pool, and I have in the past opened it to the island children every afternoon from 3 to 5, lifeguarding. And um, they're awfully nasty kids with strangers. They're nice with each other, but if somebody's grandson comes along, who isn't part of the clique, the island kids can be awful. And part of my job is to teach them to be a little more civilized. It, so I, I had this one perfectly nice little boy, probably 10 years old, and the other kids were not letting him in. And he was trying to be let in to the game. And one of them said, you're just a queer, you're just a faggot. And I said, <laughs> I said, I know you're using those terms because you think they're awful. Well, sure. I said, well, they're not awful. There's nothing wrong with being queer. There's nothing wrong with being a faggot. And so if you want to use them as insults, they're not. So just don't. <laughs> well, he swam off, and then he came back, and he hung his elbows on the deck, and he looked up at me, and he said, you really don't think being queer is awful? I said, no, I don't. How come? I said, because I am queer. <laughs> And he looked at me and he said, with who? <laughs> but you know, I, I suspect that that child is probably going to grow up gay. <laughs> I, I, and I think the tension in a lot of the kids that do that is a tension of feeling those impulses in themselves and hating themselves and therefore turning those names at somebody else uh, as a kind of self-protection. And if there isn't a grown-up or more than one grown-up standing there saying, there's nothing wrong with that, it's all right, then it just proliferates in the sense of blame and shame and uh, making people feel less than human. And I think we do all have a job to speak to our young. And I think our attitudes in this society still are very negative about sexuality. Period. Period. And it's not just homosexuality. I, I, I've thought for many years that the reason so many heterosexuals find us appalling is that they have learned to be decently ashamed of their own sexuality. <laughs> and so how, how on earth could we be proud of ours? I mean, it just doesn't seem fair. <laughs> And I've wanted to recommend a straight Pride Day, so that... <laughs> because I think heterosexuality is just another way of loving. <laughs> I don't see any shame in it at all. And some of my best friends and even my parents are heterosexual. <laughs> but I really seriously think that our problem is that we don't deal with our sexuality except in such negative and blundering ways that we really aren't fully adult and so we don't know what to teach our children. We just want to say to them, uh, don't talk about it, don't know about it, and then we expect them to be 21 years old and uh, be perfectly grown up sexual beings once they're married. Well, think of the amount of time you spend teaching your kids toilet training. Think of the amount of time you teach them table manners and how long it takes. And you totally ignore their sexuality and expect them to blossom into sexual adults, and they don't. We don't. And you're disappointed and astounded when they don't. Yes. And, and, and negative in response. I think, too, there's an aspect of what you've been saying that strikes me very much, again, thinking about the period in which we came out. Um, which for me was when I was 16 years old, which would have been 1946. Um, 
the, the, the purpose of coming out was to escape the ghetto that one would be put in, and, and inevitably was put in, in those days, by saying, I am a homosexual. Then you were consigned to this, we don't talk about him, go over there and be with your own people and be very, very quiet about it all. I was once commanded on the loss of my job, on the basis of I would lose my job if I was not obedient to this, and alas, I was obedient. I was told when I was in a company of actors, a theater, a theatrical company, in a town where there, where there was also a ballet school, and I was having an affair, this would be when I was about 19, with a dancer, a male dancer, and we were seen in the street together. Well, of course, any male person who danced was automatically mm -hmm. considered to be, you know, he was a homosexual, but they're automatically considered to be the, all that was worse that went with that in the interpretation of homosexuality that adhered in those days. And I was taken to the manager's office of the company, and I was told I was not to be seen with this person again in public. This is 1951, Jane. Mm. I was told not to add, and I said, all right, I won't. We'll conduct our affair behind closed doors. Mm -hmm. So it was to break free of that that the coming out process happened. The reason I brought this up is because it seems to me that now we are in grave danger of creating ghettos of our own, places to hide in places to be gay in, exclusively, that don't address the rest of what's going on in the world. Yes, it is ours. Yes, it is filled with all kinds of things that must be addressed and that only we can address. But one thing I think you and I share as writers is that we have gone to the point of addressing more than that. We embrace everything in our writing. Well, for me, as, as a realist, I mean, I live essentially in a straight world, and I always have at work and teaching with children. I mean, we are 10% of the population. And to have a sense that my gayness is the only thing I have access to uh, would be to limit me uh, incredibly as a writer and to limit you incredibly as a writer. In, and also to make a kind of statement that uh, we feel so alienated, we feel so different, uh, we accept the world's judgment of us that we can only live in ghettos, mm -hmm. uh, which I have rebelled against always, uh, rebelled against it whether it is because I'm a woman that I don't belong or because I'm gay that I don't belong or uh, that I'm too young or that I'm too old or whatever it is that somebody is saying, you don't fit, I think it has been my instinct to say, uh, oh, yes, I do. I'm part of you and you're part I'm of me. Here. Yes. yes. <laughs> and I know when, when uh, Memory Board came out, um, which is a novel about people in their late 60s. Well, I was in my 50s then, and somebody said, how can you write about old people? You're not old. And they, you know, I could have written about a six-year-old and it was fine, but I hadn't got there yet, so I couldn't talk about it. <laughs> and I thought, what's old? Yeah. You know, what is it that is old that I can't see and know uh, beforehand? Or know as some old people never will? And what the hell do they think writing is about if they ask that question? <laughs> I mean, isn't that astonishing? Well, I think a lot of people You think actually that. imagine something. Yeah. <laughs> But can they trust it? <laughs> <laughs> but I think you have a choice of either honing your imagination with a kind of passionate sympathy, uh, a, a kind of passionate desire to know, or you're stuck with a kind of narcissism that is boring by the time you're three years old. I mean, human grammar has to do with being a part of all we've met. 
And certainly Tiff goes to the most gorgeous extremes. I mean, he's met more parts than I've ever known. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've had a good time, I must say. <laughs> it's, um, well now, Madam, here we are at this stage of the conversation. Is this the right moment to bring? Well, since, you, since you touched on the subject of aging, I want to encourage, since you're almost the age of the characters in memory board. <laughs> I may get there. <laughs> and it was something that you alluded to earlier. There was a subject you wanted to talk more about. Is, is aging, I mean, the, the, the cliche of aging is that you're still whatever age, 19, 23, 34, whatever your good year was inside, and then the, the body is just proceeding to betray. But what, what's your sense of aging? You go. Well, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, gentlemen first. <laughs> the uh, um, oh, can I before I oh, this wonderful. And when Jane said gentlemen first, um, there's there's a marvelous anecdote about Edna Ferber and Dorothy Parker, who come at a party to a doorway together, <laughs> and. <laughs> Uh, Miss Ferber said to Miss Parker, Mrs. Parker, she said, oh my dear, age before beauty, offering the doorway to Dorothy Parker. And Dorothy Parker offering the doorway to Edna Ferber said, no, no, my dear, uh, swine before pearls. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had that kind of wicked mind that could spin those off at that kind of... Well, you do when um, you sit at your typewriter, yeah, it's, it's just yeah. off the cuff, yeah. it's not so easy. Um, no, I've forgotten what the question about aging. <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> That's the trouble, uh, Tim. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'll tell another anecdote. <laughs> but, uh, but one I adhere to, one that really moved me and has altered the way I feel about certain aspects of aging, and that is the immediate, the physical, the, 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 the appearance. You know, we're all vain. I'm vain. And there have been moments when I, in great despair, <laughs> I've said to Bill Whitehead, dear, couldn't, couldn't we afford a little tuck or, you know, <laughs> I mean, just something to make me feel better. <laughs> it doesn't matter what I look like, really, but it would make me feel better. And I, around the time that first began to happen in my psyche, uh, by psychic meetings with the mirror, I, I read uh, the autobiography of a, a great, great artist whose name was Simone Signore, an actress in f mostly in film. And uh, she uh, had, at the time that the, the anecdote occurred, had reached the age of about 45. She had passed, I think, was beginning to pass through the menopause. And she was also gaining weight and she was an alcoholic, so that some of that was beginning to show around the puffiness of the eyes. But she remained, and it wasn't physical, it was the spiritual beauty of this extraordinary gorgeous, woman yeah. shone out of this wonderful face. <clears throat> she was filming on location, and consequently there were members of the public and they were standing there, and they started saying, and she overheard them saying, oh my God, doesn't she look terrible? And she used to be such a raving beauty, my dear, and it was awful to watch her at this stage of her career. And she went inside and she thought, everyone, all my contemporaries are having facelifts and, and cosmetic surgery. Why don't I have this now? And it will ensure the, my career and so on. And then she said to herself, no, to do that to my appearance is to deny what all of this means. 
which means I have passed through time with my contemporaries. And to throw a lifted face in their faces is to say, <coughs> it meant nothing. And it did mean everything. And so she never had it done and remained one of the great, great wonders of, of the physical world alone, let alone <coughs> as an artist. And that, that, that aspect of, of aging which has to do with appearance Although it's superficial, it is the first intimation we have every single day. You rise from the bed, you struggle in whatever way you must to the mirror. <laughs> and when you find yourself in the mirror, it is never the person you are inside. <laughs> Not ever. There's a child, there's a person with immense energy. There's a, there's a boy still in me. And he's never there in the mirror. <laughs> and, and you have to, but, you know, but laughter aside, you have to live with that. But was he when you him. were a boy? I think then there was a sort of sedate adult in some ways. <laughs> <laughs> you see? <laughs> I mean, this, this is the thing that I think is so <laughs> subverting of our own confidence. Yes. Is I know when I was a child, I couldn't stand being a child. I wanted to be a grown-up. Sure. And yeah, we wanted to be adults. Yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. But I think the other thing is that, yes, I think we're all vain. We're all trying to recognize a, a face that is, if not beautiful, at least acceptable in the public world. <laughs> and yet, I know for me... Speak for yourself. Oh, <laughs> I am. <laughs> I know for me that other people's aging faces are far, far more interesting and far more beautiful than young faces. Yeah. Because they do, in fact, show and express the lives they've lived through. Yeah. And so that they are far more interesting, far more radiant than, than young faces. They are uh, far more moving, far more poignant. Uh, and to the face of dying and death, there is a kind of compelling quality that I really don't find in the young. I'm very fond of the young. I'm very fond of the way they look. I mean, I like their dear flesh and their agility, but they aren't as faces interesting yet. They will be. And yet I know that for our own vanity, we, we don't give that kind of kind or interested look at ourselves in the mirror. And I think that is partly the cliche of our society, that once we have gotten past a certain age, we aren't interesting. But I think we're fascinating. I don't... No, I agree. I, I agree. And I, I, don't, I don't find any sense of, of uh, worry about that kind of thing. I think that for me, um, the loss of obsession, the loss of energy, is to some extent a grief, but it also opens up a daily world that I haven't lived in in years. I mean, Tiff, I go out to lunch. <laughs> well, other people may go out to lunch. I haven't gone out to lunch for years and years and years. There was never time. No, never time. And somebody will call me now and say, let's go out to lunch. And I feel as if I'm committing one of the freedom sins of the world. <laughs> And I find a lot of delight in uh, ordinary living that I didn't have time for before. And so it seems to me also that partly uh, what I try to learn is what is this season? Uh, use it, accept it. Um, make it what it is. Don't fight against it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, before I had arthritis, I walked all over Galliano Island. Well, I've done that. It's still in my head. Yes, exactly. It isn't as if one never did. And I, I think one of the lucky things about my living is I've traveled all over the world. I've done what I wanted to do. And if I have a time now of being sedentary, uh, I have all sorts of things to remember. I have all sorts of things to learn about being older. And things to do. Yeah. New things to do. Yes. Yeah, that weren't available yeah. before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's no question about that. I think, too, that it also makes the whole 
the whole question of making choices more interesting because there is now a limit on what can be accomplished. Right. Because and you know, you that's, have a, sense of that's a great relief. It is I mean, indeed. Do you yeah, remember it what it was yeah. like when your whole life was before you? Terrifying, just terrifying. <laughs> and how, how many ways you could fail? <laughs> well, there aren't any m m many ways left to fail now. <laughs> And uh, we are all going to, gracefully perhaps, perhaps not. But I do think it's an enormous relief to be older because it, it does seem to me that in my teens and 20s, I lived in terror. I lived in terror of failing at everything. I felt in terror of not being the right kind of person, of not knowing well enough how to write to make my, my voice heard. And then, by God, I did write well enough to be heard. And I was in trouble. <laughs> I mean, and, and when you say you backed off, when you were presented with, you live your life in private, well, I mean, I was defended at UBC after Desert of the Heart came out with, uh, you know, writers of murder mysteries aren't necessarily murderers. <laughs> uh-huh, I see. And that's how I got by for another few years. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it is wonderful not to be frightened of the world. And that's something I don't think you do get until you're a certain age. I think uh, I, uh, my, my grandmother, my little grandmother, had to go crazy before that happened because she had been divorced at a time when nobody was. She lived as a recluse. She was terrified. Then she went out of her mind. And parties that she'd inv been invited to for years and never gone to, they kept inviting her because she sent flowers as a refusal. So that took care of the flowers at the party. But well, she suddenly started accepting these invitations. And we had to take her. And she said one time, going back in the car after one of these parties, um, do you remember when I used to say to you, I don't mind being physically uh, impaired, but I really d I'm terrified of going out of my mind? And I said, yeah. She said, it's not so bad. <laughs> And then she said to me, um, after we'd been at this party, is that what I was afraid of? Is that what I was afraid of? Is that all? Yeah, Peggy Lee's right. And I think that's a wonderful place to get to. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I think my little grandmother taught me how to do that staying sane. Jane, you're talking about choices, and one courageous and disturbing choice that you made not that long ago was to stop writing fiction. Yeah. Can you talk about that? It's a choice only in an accepting of a, a limitation, Eleanor. I don't any longer have the concentration span. I used to say, you know, uh, writing novels is a middle-aged art because you really have to have lots of memories. Well, by the time you get to be over 60, you're losing your memory. <laughs> and. Huh? Uh, well, I am. I'll speak for myself. <laughs> but you know, I still know practically every word of Desert of the Heart. When it came out in French, I thought I could learn French just by reading the book. But I don't remember enough of my later work not to repeat myself. I don't remember enough as I'm working on a piece to find it easy to do. And physically, it is difficult. And I'm on medication that makes it even more difficult. And I thought, I have had the blessing of time off and on uh, all through my adult life to say what I've had to say. And it seems to me that my friends are still around to be willing to be bored or amused by my repeating my old jokes and stories, but I don't think you should sell them. I don't think you should keep selling them. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a matter much more of recognizing the limitation and recognizing that I feel as if 12 books is enough. Uh, on this suffering planet, I think that that's enough for me to do. Does it make you sad? Does it make me sad? No. It makes me relieved. You know, writing is very hard work, and if you aren't obsessive about it, I don't, I don't know how you do it. And I think the obsession goes. It has for me, in any, in any case. And it isn't that I've stopped writing, but I do short stuff, and I do a lot of literary chores now, and that's another thing that I think 
us old folks should be doing is working hard to, to help younger writers and to do what we can in reading for contests and stuff of that sort. Writing quantities of Canada Council letters and what have you. Fighting the political battles. Tiff, you were saying earlier in reference to that scene in the wars, you said it was a ghastly, as ghastly a scene as I have ever had to write, which does tap into this compulsion or obsession to write. Yeah. What, what is the, the passion that, that fuels your writing? And is, is it still there? Oh, yes. Uh, I think the having to is that you're, once you're committed to the, once you're committed to the integrity of the piece uh, itself, you have then you have to follow down the road that, uh, to which, uh, on which you're being led by the, that integrity. And if on that way you meet these scenes or, or, or uh, situations that you have to explore, then that's your job and you've got to do it. But you move toward it in dread. Uh, in absolute dread. Yeah. And uh, because there are aspects of, of what people do to other people or things that happen in life that are um, the stuff of true nightmare. And uh, it is not at all pleasant to get in there where that is the mode. But, the, but you, you have to do it, but what you have to do also is do it responsibly. Uh, it's not an indulgence by a long shot. Uh, it is a very careful honing of what is there to be said. Um, I had to do it with Headhunter. Yes. And a scene in which a man contemplates incest with his three nieces, uh, who are all in their teens. And again, the, I wrote it first as an as an exercise in, in, in literally, can I accomplish this without it all falling to pieces under my hand? Um, but if it is your job, you have to extract what you know of people, and this is partly what is difficult, is you have to fall back upon utterly what you know about yourself. Mm -hmm. And I had to find that man and the men who raped Robert Ross in me. And uh, because if I don't find them in me, then they have no veracity at all. Uh, I've simply made them up. And that's very hard to face, that all those people are there in oneself. I want to address the question of your saying that it's, that you, you know, that 12 is what you've done and 12 is what it will be. That is entirely your business and entirely your affair and one, no one has a right, not even Helen, to say, Jane, 13 would be good. <laughs> Helen thinks anything less than 30 is not really reputable. Oh, right. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I have to say at the same time, and this is a question, I look at you and I think, now I have to say I think that this is good, and this is what she wants, and so I have to say that's fine, Jane, go ahead and do it. <laughs> but if I sent you a box of pens once a month, <laughs> and several sheets of paper every day, there is some chance that at some point the door is not so utterly, this is a question, the door is not so utterly shut that in spite of medication, in spite of physical impairment to some degree, that a microphone, something, anything isn't going to bring the voice of something that might still be in you. You can't shut the door, Jane. Oh, I, I don't. It, it is shut. <laughs> well, open it. <laughs> open it a crack. No, no, I mean, this is serious. I mean, this is really serious. How dare you say... <laughs> how dare you say the door is closed? I mean, I mean this with immense respect, and I do. 
But how dare any of us say the door is closed? I think to or, or are you right? Are you right? I, I don't, you know, I, I don't need to make any promise to the future that would uh, absolutely exclude my writing another book. But I think to be honest about where I am now is not to say I'm suffering writer's block or I'm working on a long piece that may take me 10 years. I am not working on a book and I haven't worked on a book for four years. Mm -hmm. And I, a book has not occurred to me. And I've done other things, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've done other writing and I intend to do other writing mm -hmm. if it's not repetitive. Mm -hmm. But I doubt that I will have the energy to commit myself to anything book length and do a good job of it. And I don't want to do less than a good job. It's too um, honorable work. Bravo. <laughs> okay, there are, there's a microphone in the, in the center. If you can't get to it, I will repeat your questions. So I'm just gonna open. And may I just say one thing? I'm sure a lot of you have come here tonight with certain kinds of expectations, and they may be writerly expectations, they may be expectations about uh, ranges of aging, they may be uh, issues of gay liberation. This is your opportunity now to ask what you want us to address, and then we can say to you, if you haven't asked the question you really want to, and you go home disappointed, it's your own fault. <laughs> If, if you just go to the microphone, or if you want to, if you want to shout, I'll repeat it. Uh, why did Mr. Finley not get a flower? There were, actually, I can answer that one. He's, <laughs> he snuck in. <laughs> there were flowers when you came in. Did you, did you not get one? When you no, but I'll tell you while they're waiting for the first question, a, a, a funny story about flowers. <laughs> <laughs> I had my I had my first perm. This is back back in when in the days when I was about 45, and uh, I thought it was terrific. Uh, Bill did not think it was terrific, but had to live with it. But I was on tour for a book and consequently crossing the country from one end to the other, in Edmonton or Calgary, wearing my spiffiest. Uh, Bill and I went to a very very uh, ritzy restaurant where there was a pianist and a, you know, a chanteuse, and uh, at the door as you went in, every lady was presented with a rose. And uh, I think, looking at my beautiful hair, uh, the rose was presented to <laughs> Timothy Findlay, who passed through with Mr. Whitehead. Three seconds later, the person t delivering the roses took a second look and walked over and said, could I have the rose back, please? <laughs> and I said, no! <laughs> and, I, and I wore that rose with great pride. <laughs> it was the first male rose, I think, in the whole history of roses. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I just want to say that uh, it's really, I just am, I'm so proud to be here as, as someone who has read all of, of Timothy Finley's work, and my roommate is here, and I think she's read all of Jane Rule's work <laughs> as well. Um, I, I just want to ask, um, you were speaking earlier about um, the fact that you're both very moral writers, and um, uh, Timothy Finley, you were saying earlier about taking responsibility for those difficult scenes that you, that you have to write. And I'm just wondering, um, in relation to Headhunter, um, which has many of those difficult scenes, um, uh, many of which relate to aspects of heterosexual sex that, that, um, that many will find repellent but don't acknowledge as as such, um, why there isn't a sort of positive queer sex alternative um, in, in those pages? Um, why there isn't, do you not see maybe part of the responsibility as sort of presenting uh, a representation of, of uh, a positive uh, gay alternative? Um, not in that book, no. Uh, I think there is no positive alternative. The positive alternative to everything in that book is self-evident, or should be. 
and the pur here am I sounding off and saying the purpose of the book is, of course it isn't, because you don't write books for that reason, you don't write them in that way. But it seems to me that, that as the book delivered itself to me, that what was going on was a kind of provocation. Look, this is, this is what we have here. You are the people who are supposed to be saying there is something different. That is to say, someone who is sitting reading this horror story. This is a dystopian novel. This is not a novel about the world we want to live in. It's about the world we do live in. And the proper place for what you are suggesting, and of course it is proper, is in another kind of novel or another kind of presentation. And to some degree it is in a play that I wrote at the same time as I was writing this novel, which is called The Stillborn Lover, which is about being a homosexual in a very difficult situation, in a very difficult time. Um, the positive aspects of that are presented and triumph. But in this novel, which is a novel about the victory of depravity, and by that I only mean the lack of respect from person to person as it filters down from this bloody corporate world we live in, uh, it is not proper or needful to address the subject of the positive. It is self-evident. Are there other questions? Do you want to just shout or do you want to climb? It's simply, it's very simple. It's oh, sorry, I have to repeat the question sorry. for over here. Okay. The, the question was with respect to Timothy Finley's book, Famous Last Words, and the question of censorship, and that it was the questioner's understanding that it was permissible to write about the Duchess of Windsor while she was still alive in Canada, but not in England. Uh, it, it, is, it is a simple uh, situation. It, it has to do with the difference in the laws about libel. Uh, and at its simplest, uh, in England, in the United Kingdom, and in some European countries, where the book could also not appear until she had died, um, you can be brought to, to, charges can be laid against a novel that put words of any kind in the mouth of a living person. Literally as trivial as, will you have tea? If it is not likely that on the given date or in the given situation, the living person would have said that. And therefore, the dangers of being uh, prosecuted are eminently uh, greater. And publishers, having been stung, and lost millions simply aren't willing any longer to take those chances abroad. Uh, and so the book had to be delayed until she died, simply because then I was putting words in the mouth of a dead person. Which is permissible. It is permissible. Which, which is permissible, yes. yes. You can't, yes. The, the dead can't be libeled. Can, no, you can't be libeled then. Hated, yes, but not libeled. Mm. <laughs> The question is to Jane Rule, and the questioner thinks it must be a peculiar experience to write a book and then have it made into a movie, and would like to know how Jane feels about this, the movie version of Desert of the Heart. Um, when Desert of the Heart first came out, a number of people in Hollywood did ask for options. And this was 1965, 66. 
At that time, I knew perfectly well what they would do with the book. Uh, they would turn it into a Hollywood happy ending. That is, one of them would have to kill herself and the other one would have to get married. <laughs> and so I said no. My agent said, you know, with movies, what you do is take your money and run. And I said, I don't have any place to run. When Donna Deitch approached me uh, a good many years later, she was an independent filmmaker. She showed me every film that she had made. And then we talked about the kind of films she wanted to make. And I said, you can't make a film of this book. You can make your film taking whatever from the book is useful to you. And so, no, I don't want to have anything to do with it. I don't want to write the script. I don't know how to write scripts. I'm, I'm not even much of a moviegoer. But I trust you to make a movie that I may or may not like, but I know it won't offend me. And so I had nothing more to do with the, the process until I went to the Toronto Festival to see the film, sitting next to Donna Deitch, who was sweating blood. <laughs> And with Helen Schaefer and all her sisters and her mother and Patricia Charbonneau and her little baby that she was carrying around. And I heard um, uh, Helen Schaefer turn to her mother and say, Mother, uh, I'll tell you when to close your eyes. <laughs> and her mother said, I am not going to close my eyes. And I thought, thank God my mother's not here. I have enough to deal with. <laughs> I was amazed with the opening of the film. It's the only car chase I've ever seen that I liked. <laughs> I didn't think one could be done that I could like. I thought it was a little miracle of a film uh, to be made under such extraordinarily difficult circumstances. Uh, Donna didn't have the money even to shoot a scene over again if she didn't like the first take. And I know there, there are parts of the movie that Donna can't look at because of that. But given the limitation of budget, um, I think it was uh, just a marvelous job, and of course, it gave a whole new life to the book. And it's now been translated into many different languages. It's sold many, many more copies. And so, uh, in a sense, the film gave the book a second birth. So you don't have to choose between one and the other. Uh, thank heaven we have them both now. So that's what it was like. The, the question is, uh, in giving as illustration what's uh, happened to uh, Bill Kinsella and his depiction of uh, Native or First Nations people, and what do people on the stage think about the issue of appropriation of voice? I, uh, I'm going to leap in here because I'll be addressing that in the Duthie Lecture on Sunday. It's part of, of what that, that uh, address will be about. Um, and I, and it, it obviously, to, in order to protect a, a modicum of interest, shall I say? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't want to blow it all here, but, um, <laughs> but, but, but I think it's fair, and then I'll, I'll shut up, because I think Jane has some interesting things to say about this. Uh, I am very concerned about the whole business of appropriation fully understanding and beginning the bottom line is the integrity of voice itself and the integrity of everyone's voice and that no invasion no I hesitate to use the word appropriation but no using in any way of the voice of someone other than oneself, especially where it addresses questions vital to the possessor of the voice, should begin by dampening that voice. Equally, and I think that we are in very grave danger here. All doors must stay open. 
when these issues have been raised in other times and other ways, the result has been persecution. And if in addressing this subject one were to use the word fascist as a description of the attitude of those who disagree with the appropriation of any other voice but one's own, it is always forgotten that if, for instance, I use that word in describing it that way, I'm not talking about the end product of fascism or the depravity of camps and the depravity of all the things that go with that belief. I'm talking about how it began. The insidious beginnings, for instance, that were laid in place when Salman Rushdie suffered the fatwa. That is an issue about appropriation of voice, and it is an issue about political um, what's the phrase? Correctness. Correctness. And these are intertwined. So it's not something to be dealt with lightly, and it's not something to take a stand on lightly. As writer, as it affects writers, it is of an, a matter of immense importance immense importance. I think one of the problems for me with the issue is that I feel that the cry, the cries from those people who feel they have no voices of their own and that they are being misrepresented by other people uh, speak right to, to the center of my own sense of being an outsider. Uh, I understand absolutely how they feel. I don't think that their solution to the problem is the right one. I don't think to silence other people is the solution to their problem. I think the solution to their problem is for them to speak and for them to be allowed to speak and for them to be welcomed in their speech. But as it always is with those of us who are in oppressed positions, we first attack our friends. They're safer than our enemies. And we blame our own fear on other people making us afraid. And so I think it's a job for each of us understanding what it is to be an outsider, to acknowledge that cry, but also to stand up to it and say, if I exclude you from my work, I am saying that you don't exist. If I can't put a black man in a novel of mine, if I can't put a Japanese woman in a novel of mine, if I can't put a native person in a novel of mine, well or badly, I'm saying you do not exist in my world, and that's not true. It is absolutely not true. I, I would hope that in any character I try to present, uh, even the toughest heterosexual males that I try to present, I go with a kind of, as Tiff calls it, integrity, sensitivity, and need to explore, as far as I know how to explore, that experience. But I want to say this too, that I have found my enemies useful. I have learned a lot from Nor Norman Mailer, <laughs> and a lot that makes me safer in this world for knowing what's out there. And so even from those who would um, efface us from the earth, even for, for those who are speaking in hatred, we are better to know that that exists and to contend with it in the public scene and in politics than to pretend it doesn't. But I think that's at the extreme of what I'm talking about. At the center of what I'm talking about is that we have to be able, as novelists, to speak the whole world as we see it and hope uh, that our imaginations serve not only us, but all of you well in your great diversity.
There's someone at the microphone. Um, I had a comment, first of all, that for Jane Rule, that Desert of the could Heart. You, could you either raise the mic or duck? Sorry. <laughs> I'm tall. Um, I wanted to say that as an 18-year-old, Desert of the Heart really helped me to feel welcome into a, a new world for me. And so I thank you for that. Um, um, we talked earlier a little bit about censorship and then into education and how censorship has affected education and how we can educate our own children and children that we know about um, homosexuality. But uh, do you have any specific ideas on how we can somehow educate more young people or is there a way through novels or through the school system or some way to educate the people who set up the school system so that we can present the education to reduce the bad ideas or to reduce the prejudice? It's a big question. It sure it, is. It's, you've been a teacher, so... It seems to me that it is beginning to be addressed. And it, as it's being addressed, it's also being resisted. It's not easy. And as I say most of us were raised ignorant and we're still blundering pretty much ourselves in how we're dealing with what we're dealing with. But um, many more uh, people are, are talking about the including of and dealing with minority circumstances, not only with homosexuality, but with a whole range of race and racial problems that are in the schools. And the urgency to teach tolerance, the urgency to insist upon opening up imaginations rather than getting warring cliques is uh, if we don't teach our children this, uh, we're going to be another Bosnia. I mean, it, it seems to me alive and well in the world, all of this hatred, suspicion, fear. And we've got to work very hard with our children uh, to let them feel safe enough and loved enough and understood enough so that they can start very early doing that with other people. I think where the question of homosexuality is concerned too, it is as it is with most sexual matters in terms of teaching. Parents and teachers withdraw from it. <laughs> and, and that a lot of the attitudes about, about putting homosexuality on the plate in terms of education is not really involved so much with blatant homophobia as it is with simply fear of addressing the subject. Right. And it's that that has to be overcome, is the fear of addressing the subject, mm -hmm. That's, which in part is the fear of being identified and equally of being identified as one who understands. Mm -hmm. And this is what education is about, and this is why it's so frustrating, but equally I have great sympathy for, the, for that fear because that is the fear we've all gone oh, through is. of saying, I am here. Mm. This is me. I would just like to comment on that by saying um, that it is important and it is wonderful to see people like yourselves as martyrs, I suppose, and people to look up to for young people. Well, well no, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to find people to look up to um, that you respect and who stand up for what they believe in, especially when it comes to homosexuality and to yourselves and to that growing group of people who young people can admire and strive for that kind of excellence. I think that that's really wonderful that you're here tonight and talking about these things openly. Thanks. Timothy, my question is to you. Um, in reading your books, um, <laughs> in reading Famous Last Words and The Wars, it's very intriguing, the uh, interweaving of history. <coughs> Um, and creative writer flow that, that you display in those books. And it's hard not to ask yourself when you're reading them what, how much of this is real history and how much is your creative um, interpretation. And it becomes an intriguing part of the whole reading process. And I'm just wondering if you would comment about that in some way. Obviously, there's a lot of research that went into both those books as well. 
Yes, indeed, uh, but uh, but and great, uh, great, greatly interesting it was to do. Um, I had a conversation with the American novelist E. L. Doctorow, who wrote an incredibly uh, intricate novel, interweaving all kinds of realities and real people in, with the characters, the fictional characters in the book called Ragtime. And uh, I, I always remember him saying, isn't it funny when you, once you've declared your area, uh, and his was uh, turn of the century, uh, e the eastern seaboard of, of North America, uh, you become a magnet. Um, and it, it literally zaps at you. It, all the material comes zapping across the board at you. The minute I said the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, all that material sort of flew at me from everywhere I could. I couldn't open a book anywhere that didn't have a reference one way or another, because the eye begins to see. So the, in other words, the, the research may be intricate and, and prolonged, but it's always absolutely fascinating, and it's somewhat easier than you, you think it's going to be. Addressing the question of mixing one with the other, I always believed in, in the moment, and maybe I mean the moment only, and maybe I don't. I don't really know, but I think I mean the moment only. In the moment, I believed that all the fiction was true. I really did. I wrote, she the Duchess of Windsor in particular, in Famous Last Word, she became a character of my own. She became a character of my invention. But everything that was put on the page about her was absolutely true. But the way in which it was presented in that novel was unique in terms of all the other ways it had been presented in biographical material written about her. Uh, and so she became a very large fictional character. And in essence, that is what she was, uh, which is absolutely true. She made herself up. <laughs> and uh, and it's a, it's a, it, that's what I became, came to the moment when I realized, she's wonderful. I've been given this immense gift of a woman who has cre self-created her entire being. Um, you have a responsibility to history. And that responsibility involves, uh, there's the word again, the integrity of history and the integrity of the people involved in history. And you must not cross that. But you can make up and create fictions around the truths in history that can be magical. And uh, it's a mode that I, have in those novels in particular, enjoyed uh, using uh, greatly. And I always was very pleased uh, in the prideful way of, of a, one sentence in, in uh, Famous Last Words in which um, the man writing on the walls, Moberly, has written, in writing out the story of all these extraordinary people, he writes the words, everything I have written here is true except the lies. And that's all writing. That is the story of all writing. In terms of that mix of fiction and, and research, I've always wanted to ask you, uh, in Not Wanted on the Voyage, why do the angels have webbed feet? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it, it comes from this wonderful image out of Milton. As... Uh, into the mic, Tiff. As uh, into the mic. Uh, into the mic. Oh, it's, it's a poem. <laughs> Wrote, wrote the, the, uh, the, the other, whoever they were. Um, it comes out of Milton, Eleanor. It comes out of, forgive me, I feel awful talking to <laughs> you. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Mrs. Chen, I'm Eleanor. <laughs> you, can you be Eleanor? Sure. <laughs> um, it, it comes, uh, it came from reading, the reading of Milton when uh, Lucifer falls or is pushed from heaven. Uh, in Paradise Lost, and it's wonderful, the imagery and the writing. One of the first manifestations is he becomes, um, I believe it is, a cormorant, which I put in the novel. So that the webbed feet come of angels came directly from 
from an image I grabbed from something he might not have intended at all. But the, the, bus the business of seabirds and their webbed feet, I suddenly had this wonderful image that angels must hide their hands because th that's what gives them away. It isn't the wings. You know, we all have wings. <laughs> but uh, we don't all have the webbed hand. So that's how it happened. In case I stole it from Milton. <laughs> <laughs> and he wrote some time ago. What, what do you both feel about the emerging bisexual identity? As a <laughs> Maybe I didn't get that right. <laughs> In the light of an emerging bisexual movement, then the question. We were trying it out with photographs this afternoon. <laughs> She's not kidding. And then they were taken for a gay paper. <laughs> no, I, 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 I said we were having these wonderful photographs taken. Wait till you see them. Uh, and I, I said, Jane, <coughs> let us do something outrageous. And Jane said, Tiff, we, you and I can't possibly do anything outrageous. <laughs> not, not after all we've done. And I, I then said, oh, yes, we can, and smiled at her secretly, so we'll see. Um, <laughs> I don't think I understand the question. I, I, I think the question really is focused on uh, uh, a sense of a political movement ah. of bisexuality and how it may influence the literary world. And I don't have much of a sense. But I, quite seriously, the sense of sexuality that we have is a changing one all the time. We are so extraordinarily educable as human creatures that we can be taught to believe almost anything. I mean, we can be taught to believe that women have no sexual desire or feeling at all, and believe it. We can be taught that there is no such thing as homosexuality, and believe it, until experience shoves at us something else. Uh, as each of us ghettoizes ourselves, if we do, in our own sexuality, and this may simply mean that you choose a mate, and therefore cut off other opportunities or other options, you tend to oversimplify what your sexuality is or anyone's sexuality is. And it seems to me that probably most of us are bisexual. Uh, otherwise, why would we work so hard to teach everybody to be heterosexual? I mean, what would be the urgency? Bravo. If, if um, it was natural if and it was uh, natural. So, it was the only natural. You're absolutely mm. right. And so I think we start What's out with many more choices than, than our society teaches us we have. I think a lot of our choices have to do not only with desire, but with politics, have to do with uh, the kinds of freedoms we want, have to do with the kinds of cliches of relationship that we've seen and don't want for ourselves. And so I think we make choices that do have to do with desire. But I think our desire, our options for desire, are much wider, all of us, than we're taught to believe. And because we're taught not to believe that, it takes a fairly urgent experience to teach us otherwise. And some of us have it, and some of us don't. And some of us have it and say, oh my god, this is just what they're telling me I'm not supposed to do. And 20 years later, when the children are grown, well, what is that person going to call him or herself? If you've been married and raised children, and after they're gone, you both go your separate ways and find you're with mates of your own sex, are you bisexual? I would think so. Maybe serially. <laughs> But I think it's a much more open and pervasive um, possibility. And, and I wish more men felt comfortable with it, too. Mm -hmm. more, many more women do, I think. Yeah, I think it increasingly seems. so because of the yeah. women's movement, yes. Yeah. 
And because women live longer, so they can be. <laughs> are you trying to say there are things to look forward to in old days? <laughs> I like the idea of being serially omnisexual. Oh, I like omnisexual. So, 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 I can only remember so much. Uh, <laughs> speaking of memory, the question is about memory and uh, refers first to Timothy Finley's Inside Memory, where you say that uh, we are our memories, and then to Memory Board by Jane Rule, where the central character is losing her memory and the responsibility that this places on the people around her. And if you could say something about that character. Constance. Constance. Wonderful name for yes. I, After the book was published, I was invited by the Medical Association to address the Association on Alzheimer's Disease, which she doesn't have. And I was really startled that the Medical Association would want a novelist to talk to them <laughs> about a disease that the character didn't have. But, <laughs> but I... <laughs> On the whole, I thought it was encouraging, just the same. <laughs> uh, all, all my characters really do start out as ideas and um, flesh themselves out as people gradually. And I really did partly want to deal with a sense of terrible trust in a relationship where if you've lost your memory, you have to trust someone else to tell you the truth. And this is an experience that a great many people have in great age. I mean, I, I had a, a friend, Elizabeth Hopkins, who in the last couple of years of her very long life had lost her present memory entirely. And I would go in to see her in the hospital and she'd say, where's Liz Armour? Has she gone to Italy? I said, well, she was in here this morning with your cookies. Oh, I'm such an old damn fool, she'd say. But she never said, you're lying to me. And I knew it was a gift of friendship that was quite incredible, that she could accept without paranoia that if I said it was so, I was telling her the truth, that I wasn't cheating. But it, I wanted to push it much farther than that in Constance, partly to make it premature because of the kinds of things that had happened during the war, that there were things too terrible for her to remember and that there were stresses in her life that she dealt with by not remembering. And she becomes really, she's the one character who you don't get inside her mind, she becomes the beloved. And she is really other people's tests about how well they can love somebody for whom they have to take this kind of responsibility. And it seems to me that that's one of the, that's one of the questions that we have to ask in relationship to the old as we have to ask in relationship to the young to take full responsibility for their safety. So to take full responsibility for somebody else's personhood so that they are not just a disease, but they are a person with a failing that needs total tending. And so that was one of the things. And then just what memory does, because in, in another of these characters, one who dies before the book opens, all her memories are memories that make her hostile and judgmental and keep her confined. And so I was really trying to get to what is memory worth? I mean, what is its loss? But what is it? I mean, lots of, about memory is holding grudges. Lots about memory is being angry with people for 500 years. Revenge, revenge. And so how do we use memory? How do we, how do we use memory so that it's a positive force? And so that was really the kind of question I, I was doing in that book. The unavoidance, too. There is, I don't remember whether it was elevators or escalators. I want to say escalators. I'm sure it was, in fact. It was bomb shelters that inadvertently rises at one moment. In other words, the enemy that is in memory, the, that, that informed Constance of the, of the worst 
aspects of having passed through that dreadful war and, and <coughs> what it was to have to hide and be hidden. Uh, <coughs> and she can't they rise against her will, and she can't really describe what it is that makes her afraid of, of escalators, but it's because there were escalators in, That's right. in the tube in London, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that, 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 that memory can, can be your enemy in mm -hmm. that sense, mm -hmm. too. And you, you can be in control of it, out of control of it. It's a very complex experience for all of us and endlessly interesting to explore, I mean, in all sorts of ways, in that book and others. Can you remember enough? <laughs> now, this is dangerous, and I wish we had the book with us just to read the words. But can you remember how it ends? The thing about that wonderful thing about lying and trust, which is the very ending of the book? Well, I think the very ending of the book has to do with uh, Constance admitting that she can recognize David because he's the one who plays all the different parts for her. You are anybody I want you to be. Yes. That's who you are. Yeah. And so you realize that there's a kind of recognition uh -huh. of her. But I, I, I think her sense is that she is trapped in... Having to believe. Yeah, tra and trapped, believe. trapped in knowing that, in fact, Diana does tell her the truth. Yeah. And it's very frustrating. Uh -huh. So truth is not a very comfortable thing to live no. with. Good book. Thank you. <coughs> If, if there are no more questions, um, I, I just want to, so you mentioned elevator and escalator, and I was reminded of where you find the right word or you don't find the right word, and there was a folding up umbrella sitting in the front seat of my car, and I was opening the door and inviting somebody to sit in, and I said, careful, don't sit on the elevator. <laughs> <laughs> now, where did that word come from? <laughs> so the mind goes. Uh, it's... <laughs> It's, 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 uh... But they both rise, Eleanor. <laughs> is that, is Elevators that? and umbrellas. Uh, umbrellas. <laughs> and they have how many syllables? <laughs> okay. You're a good man to have around. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. I know it's, uh, it's quite crowded and hot, and you've all been very patient and attentive, and I've enjoyed this evening, I think, at least as much as I have. Uh, the writers will be here to sign their books. Even I will be signing a book. Um, and have a safe trip home. Thank you all very much. And they're coming up here on the stage. <laughs> Who's supposed to stay here? Yes.